Good morning everyone. My name is Taryn and you are watching my channel, Nicole Flower House. In today's video, I'm going to be sharing with you my personal seed starting plan. I have about 1600 square feet of growing space in my cut flower garden and I'm located in zone 7B. Now, last year I kind of messed up with my whole seed starting plan. I planted tons of seedlings, probably in the thousands, and I thought I'll just figure out where I'm going to put these later. Well, later never came and it was a big mess. So this year I'm doing things the other way around. There were several things I needed to figure out first so that I could do this in an organized way. I took the diagram that already had all my perennials on it and added my spring bulbs that I had planted. So my ranunculus and where the dahlias were gonna go and the tulips. Then I took measurements of each box so I knew how much square footage I was working with. I assigned each box a number to make the seed starting schedule easier to label. The last step for me was to pick which plants I wanted to put in which boxes based on all the information I gathered. I looked at my seed collection and basically made a wish list of everything I wanted and just played around with plant spacing and how much I thought I could fit where until I found something that I liked. I also have things situated so I can hide them from the deer and other critters. And then finally, I made zones out of the garden in hopes of figuring out my automated irrigation system. Since I'm working with a gravity fed system, boxes of similar heights needed to be grouped together so that things could get watered evenly. Next, I started working on a seed starting schedule. Last year, I started all of my seeds at the same time which meant they were all ready to be planted out at the same time. And that was just so overwhelming and didn't go well at all. So this year I wanted to stagger my seed starting into groups about once per week until I had all of my seeds started over about an eight week period. That meant that not everything would be ready at the same time and getting the seedlings out into the garden hopefully will be a much smoother process this year. Since my garden is located in zone 7B, our average last frost date is usually mid to late April. Sometimes it's early May. Now in previous years, I've decided to take a lot of risk and get my seedlings planted out as soon as possible. So usually mid April, maybe late April. And every year I seem to be plagued by a late frost. I'm frantically trying to cover up little seedlings, hoping that they don't get killed in these late frosts. And it's very stressful. So this year I'm deciding to not plant out any frost tender seedlings until at least mid-May. This will give me a later start on the growing season, but I feel like it's worth it. What I will try to do is try to Fill that gap between spring and summer with some succession planting of bulbs and perennials. It's going to be something I have to learn from experience, but I did have a very big gap last year once my tulips were done blooming, just kind of waiting on all of my summer annuals to come into flower. So hopefully this year I can stagger a little better and just keep learning season after season what I can do to fill that gap besides planting out my seedlings really early. I may plant just a few of my frost tender stuff at the end of April just to see if they make it, but I'll save back the majority of my seedlings until early or mid-May. Something else I can do is not pinch all of my plants, only pinch some of them. Pinching is something you can do to make your flowers branch more instead of shooting up single stems. However, it does delay your first blooms. On the screen here, you've been watching me start up a seed tray. 
I like to use 72 cell trays. I also like to fill my seed trays with dry potting mix. And then after I get the seeds in there, I water it from the bottom and I let it soak in the water long enough to make sure that all of the soil is wet. This is a little different than what a lot of people do. I don't use seed starting mix. I like potting mix because it has food sources for the plant in it and I leave my seedlings in the trays longer than what you'd want to with a seed starting mix that doesn't have any food source in it and I don't want to mess with fertilizing or trying to feed plants. I also like to label my seed trays before I put the seeds in since I have a specific number of each one that I want to do this year. It just helps remind me when I want to stop one type of seed and start planting the next. So I have this seed tray nice and organized and labeled before the seeds even go in. I do want to mention that I'm planting a lot of different types of seed in one tray. Some will recommend against this because they won't grow at the same rate and that makes it a little difficult to get the lights if you're putting these under grow lights at the right height. But I don't want 72 of the same thing most of the time. So I just have to deal with the fact that my seedlings aren't gonna be growing at the same rate. But I also have lights that are pretty strong and it hasn't seemed to be a problem. Another thing I'm going to try differently this year is instead of planting a large number of varieties within one plant family, for example, 27 different types of zinnias, I'm going to choose a smaller amount of varieties so that I have more consistency of the same flower available to me. I'm doing this so that when I want to make something that needs a lot of the same flower, for example, 10 bouquets that all look similar, I will have a large number of the same flowers. Last year, since I had so many different types and color varieties, it was hard for me to do anything like that. The next thing I want to show you is a little DIY self-watering seed tray experiment I am doing. Watering seedlings, if you've grown seedlings before, is a big task. So I'm attempting to start a self-watering system. This is just capillary matting and it's from Gardener's Supply. And I've also, am going to be using just an empty tray with holes in the bottom. So a lot of drainage there. You don't really need to have the mesh on the bottom, but it's helpful in this situation. This is how I've cut the capillary matting. You see I left a little tail on the end that is still connected to the piece of mat. I cut it to exactly fit in the bottom. It's a 1020 tray and I've left that little piece connected. It's really important that it stays connected so that the water in the reservoir can travel up into that larger piece. Here's a close up of the dimensions of this piece. Again, I cut it so it'll fit exactly in the bottom of my seed tray and I left the little tail on the end. I just used a quilting rotary cutter and fabric cutter to cut these strips, but you can use scissors as well. So it's about nine inches wide and 19, I believe, inches long that's perfectly sized to fit in the bottom of that 1020 tray. I don't want any bunching or overlapping, so that's why I cut it a little short. And I left the little tail on the end. And this is preventing any kind of waste of the fabric as well, because the roll it came in was exactly this width. So I'm just taking a little piece off, but again, it's connected so that I can put it down into the water reservoir. For the capillary matting to work correctly, you do have to get it wet first. So I went and got it wet. I set it down into the bottom of the 1020 tray that has the mesh. Then 
then I'll take the seed tray that I've had soaking in water so all the soil is also all the way wet and you set it on top of the capillary matting. It's important that the soil has enough contact with the mat to draw up the water. I found that any cell size smaller than 72 just wasn't working for me. I did try a 200 cell tray and it wasn't soaking up the water. So the holes in the bottom of the seed cells need to be large enough to have enough contact with that capillary matting to soak up the water. Now this white 1020 tray that obviously does not have drainage is going to become the reservoir that you can fill up with a bunch of water. But first I'm gonna put down these. I just have two six cell packs. These are made of a tougher plastic than the disposable ones so they won't break under the weight of the seed tray. But you don't want your seed tray sitting in the water. You need to have the tray above the water. So you can put anything you want down to keep the seed tray from sitting down in the water. I've seen people use PVC pipes and other things, but you wanna stick that tail that we've left on the capillary matting down into the water reservoir. I'm not gonna fill it completely here because it makes it really hard to move around. You kinda of wanna have it set where you're going to leave it before you fill that up with water. Now this seed tray has cow pots on it and the capillary matting has been working very well with that too. They haven't dried out at all. Of course, there's a lot of contact between the pot and the capillary matting in this situation. Here's another 72 cell tray that I did earlier. Again, it's completely moist. I haven't had to water it at all. I've only had to fill this reservoir between one and two times a week, if that. These are my onion and leek starts that I did a few weeks ago. And since they can tolerate cold weather, they're fine out here and to start this early. So that's another thing. If you're itching to start seeds, you can start onions. They'll do fine in the cold. Here is an update on the 200 cell tray I did with flower perennials and slow growing things, as well as things that can tolerate frost. The last three rows I just planted new foxglove seeds. You can see the other foxglove seeds that are about two weeks old have already sprouted up along with some hollyhocks and sweet peas, calendula, and other things. I did notice though this seed tray did not work with the capillary matting. There just wasn't enough contact there. Here is an update on the eucalyptus I harvested a few weeks ago. You can see there are two different varieties in here. That one there is called Silver Drop, and this one is called Silver Dollar. So a little difference. The Silver Dollar is a little bigger, um, a less blue hint to it, and not as round as the Silver Drop eucalyptus there. All right, this is all for today's video. I hope it helped you with your own seed starting plans and so you can learn from my mistakes and my new experiments. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And the best way you can support my channel is to subscribe and share it with your flower loving friends. I'll see you next week. 